see you. Thank you, Mike. How are you? Welcome, <laughs> traders, to this afternoon's live discussion where we are going to uh, revisit um, the topics we ha had in the last discussion with respect to um, COVID pandemic, the impact of the COVID pan pandemic, how uh, the US elections played out and impacted uh, some of the scenarios that we discussed in the last session. And what we're also going to do today is we're going to look at where we are. We're going to take a, a sense check on where we are in terms of the pandemic, review some of the recent price action um, that has been uh, driving these markets. We're also going to look importantly now at, um, at the vaccination rollout and how that's likely to impact the markets going forward and how that's going to help drive some of the strategies that me and my fellow uh, market strategists are, are looking to employ over the coming weeks and months. And we're going to finish up by looking at the most important thing, the tail risks, the what if scenarios, and uh, I'm going to cover off where we see uh, some potential hazards in, uh, in future days. So uh, welcome again to today's session. Uh, my name is Patrick Munley. I've, uh, I've been actively involved in the financial markets for over 15 years. I'm a money manager running a multi-million dollar portfolio. In addition to my money management business, I'm the head of trader education for FX Career Swap, leading a community of 130 retail traders, helping them to become consistently profitable professionals. And I'm also a resident market expert at Tickmill, providing market strategy and analysis. And I'm dialing in today from a pretty windy Mallorca, so you'll have to bear with me in the background. I've got brilliant sunshine here. I've got all the shutters shut because I've got 100, 100 kilometers of winds going on in the background, so please bear with me. Um, so let me introduce you to the panel. Uh, Joseph Tahrea uh, is a market strategist for Tickmill Middle East. He's a certified financial technician. He's been tra actively trading the capital markets since uh, 2010. He specializes in Elliott Way theory and using advanced methods to analyze the market, enabling traders to better understand the dynamics in capital markets. Uh, Taba Maseka, Joseph. Thank you. Hi, Patrick. It's my pleasure being here with you today. Thank you. Good stuff. Okay, uh, also from uh, Germany, we have uh, Mike Sidel, who's a professional trader, uh, tick mill strategist, and financial market coach. He's been uh, in the markets uh, for over 20 years, full-time trading since 2012. He's a financial market coach uh, since 2013 as founder and CEO of Investor Schuler. He's author, also a contributor and author for Traders Magazine. Guten Nachmittag, Mike. <laughs> hello, Patrick. Uh, hello, all together. And uh, welcome uh, for all of our um, viewers here this afternoon. I'm pretty happy to be the second time um, in, this, in this panel discussion. And uh, I hope we can have a good time. And I invite all of our um, audience, if you have any questions, don't hesitate. Write it down uh, into uh, the notepad. And we will uh, take this and uh, talk about our opinion uh, for the traders. And I'm really looking forward uh, to the things that we will discuss today during the uh, next uh, half an hour, 45 minutes uh, to the double development of uh, the economy during the, the, uh, the, the COVID-19 wave two. So let's go on. Great stuff. Thanks, Mike. And last but not least, Carlos Valverde has been in the capital markets for over 10 years. He provides technical and fundamental analysis to uh, for the Forex markets, for Tickmill's Spanish and European client base, as well as market intelligence, macro and news reports. Uh, he also supports clients in terms of trading, analysis and execution. So, buenas tardes, Carlos. Muy buenas tardes, Patrick. Welcome, everybody. Thank you very much for the introduction. I hope you are enjoying the Mallorca sun. <laughs> I am, I am. <laughs> Not like in Madrid, it's a bit rainy, a bit... Uh, cold but uh, i'm very happy here to be here again with you guys and with the fellow traders out there that are willing to expand the knowledge or try to get a, an insight for this year thank you patrick excellent stuff okay so as i say we're going to break this down into four sections i'm going to start now by a quick review of the first wave of uh, the covid pandemic and we're then going to look at how that impacted uh, markets. So globally, uh, sadly to say at the moment, there have been over 105 million confirmed cases of COVID-19. This includes over 2.3 million deaths globally. COVID-19 pandemic has triggered the deepest economic recession in over a century, threatening health, disrupting economic activity, 
and hurting well-being and jobs. Extraordinary policies have been required to walk the tight ropes towards recovery, which will shape the economic and social prospects for the coming decade. The economic downturn res resulting from COVID-19 restrictions has been concentrated among certain types of businesses. The global economy measured by gross domestic product shrank by record levels. Following the start of the first lockdowns last March, by September 2020, after a summer of relaxed measures, GDP was still down globally uh, compared to February. Services such as hospitality, bars, restaurants and hotels recorded almost no output during the lockdowns. But industries such as information and communication, where staff could largely work from home, saw little change really compared with the February data. Consumer facing services have since bounced back somewhat, but have been hit again by the second round of lockdowns. At this stage, it's difficult to separate temporary losses of outputs brought about by the coronavirus restrictions from longer term behavioral changes that could Im impact industries for years to come. While some industries shrank by, shrank by up to 90% in April and May last year, others recorded marginal growth, leading to unprecedented economic support stimulus and wild market swings. And to just recap some of those market movements, I'm gonna hand, uh, hand the mic over to Joseph and uh, he's gonna bring us up to speed with his perspective. Thank you, Patrick. So as you mentioned before, like uh, as a quick recap for the first uh, wave of COVID and the impact which we saw hit the market like uh, really hard. So basically uh, after the, the first wave, uh, after the con contagion from Asia started to the rest of the world, uh, the capital markets, and uh, I will be mentioning especially the equities here, uh, were retreating, but were still in a good uh, shape uh, at first. Um, after the, the World Health Organiza Organization, the WHO declared the COVID as an outbreak, as a pandemic, as a real pandemic, and the acceleration in the spread of the virus have caused many governments to start the shutdown and the strict measures uh, like the travels, etc. So here the reaction of the financial market uh, started and it has been uh, really uh, aggressive and violent. Uh, comparing Patrick to the moves we saw back then in the financial crisis in 2008, the fall of the equities was really uh, uh, hard uh, that we witnessed. So of course, the most of the investors like investors shifted to the safe haven, which is especially the gold. Uh, the gold already was uh, in a surge, but like this crisis pushed uh, the gold further to, to new highs. So if I want to mention like technically what happened to the Dow Jones, especially uh, the Dow Jones, as you mentioned in the, in the previous uh, panel discussion we had, the Dow Jones was entering in a, in a sideways market and in need for a correction or a corrective pullback in order for the prices to be uh, interesting again, let's say to, to buy. Uh, so the Dow Jones was trading near 20, 29,500, near the psychological level, which is the 29,500 or the 30 level. So if a pullback of wave four was really expected in order for the trend to continue. And technically speaking, we were, we were waiting for a pullback to the previous low um, which was the 21,400, which, which was a, a really far number uh, technically, but uh, it was expected as a pullback or a big wave for, uh, we're talking about the big trend here. So what happened on the Dow Jones was uh, really a crash of course, but like it was at the same time a correction for all this, uh, these years and the uptrend that was happening. And talking about the Apex market, uh, let's talk a little bit about the currencies. After the hit uh, took place, uh, uh, after the COVID first wave, we saw the dollar index especially surging from 95 level and ro rose to, to 103 level. So basically, because the dollar has acted the safe haven currency uh, among traders uh, during the times of intense, uh, let's say market stress in the past. So that's why that's why all the investors uh, uh, cho chose the, the dollar index as a safe haven currency. Because first of all, it's the most liquid currency in the world. Uh, the, US, the US economy is less reliant uh, on external demands uh, than much developed countries. And of course, the spread of the virus at the beginning was relatively less aggressive in the US than Europe and, and Asia. 
So that's why we saw the dollar index surge at, at the beginning and we saw the hit uh, for most of the currencies. The new lows in the euro reaching targeting 106 again, the, the low here we're talking uh, uh, mid uh, at the end of February and mid-March. We saw the new lows for the pound hitting uh, 1.14 again as a double bottom. We saw the Aussie uh, retargeting 0.55, which was a huge, big number for us. 0.55 is 88.2% Fibonacci retracement for the grand cycle of the Aussie dollar. Speaking of year 2000, reaching to 2011 high, which is 1.1. If we take all this grand cycle and we take a Fibonacci retracement, the 88.2% was zero at 0 0.55 level. So it was a really important level for the Aussie dollar as well. And of course the hit was mainly for the countries which demand or like which uh, uh, heavily de is dependent on the production of commodities, especially oil. Because after the hit of the oil and all the lockdowns and uh, the minimal demand on oil, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, barrels, we saw the oil hit uh, almost $0 for, for the May contracts. We remember all this, uh, the, the, the crash, the sharp fall in oil. So all the currencies for the countries dependent on the production of oil, such as the, the let's say, the Russian rub, uh, ruble, uh, shredding around 16%. We saw the Mexican peso, Colombian peso. We saw the, the losses as well in the Brazilian and South African uh, currencies almost hit 10%. So basically after all this crash, uh, the market reached an interesting levels. In case of the Dow Jones, which is the almost 19, 20,000, the Aussie dollar, the Euro, the pound, all these, uh, uh, let's say the equities and the FX market reached an important levels. Here we started talking about a possible scenario of recovery, technical one, which might be a V-shape recovery, a U-shape, an L-shape, and of course, we witnessed the V-shaped recovery after all this, uh, the surge again in the Dow Jones and targeting new record highs. And as well, we saw the pound and the Euro and the Aussie retraced from the lows and now trading at current levels. So basically the, the, the recovery was very fast and it was a V-shaped recovery. This is basically a, a, a all in all, a, a small recap about what happened the crash and, and the recovery phases we, we witnessed in the market after first wave. Excellent, Joseph. Thanks for the, uh, the recap there. And um, I guess what we want to quickly do now is just move on to um, talk about the, the second wave, I guess, which, um, which we've all had to live through. Um, second wave, I guess, challenged, but um, didn't really derail the market consensus as such for this V-shaped global recovery um, from, the, from the recession that uh, Joseph was just talking about. More official stimulus and vaccine rollouts should help this recovery from most market consensus is in the second quarter of 2021 and boost the reflation trade as such and keep risky assets supported. We have a blue wave in the US Congress which means much more aggressive fiscal stimulus up front, but higher taxes and potential overregulation to come in the medium to long term. On the data front, 2021 has started out with a bit of a wobble, most notably in mainland China, where all the PMI data, both the Kaishin and the MBS, suggest that the recovery has lost momentum at the start of the year. And as a result of restrictions being put in place to stem the spread of the new infections over the new year holiday. US jobs data was also weak in January. The pickup in payrolls did offset less than a quarter of, a, of the drop seen in December. And total employment has only since risen 0.2% since October. Although across the world, the number of COVID-19 cases has rolled over in some of the worst affected countries from a month ago, restrictions in place are hurting economic activity. The good news is that in aggregate, the global number of new COVID cases is slowing. Despite risks around new variants of disease, vaccine rollouts are accelerating and more candidates are being approved for new vaccines. The light at the end of the tunnel is becoming slightly more visible, even if the pace of the movement towards it is slowing somewhat. There are also some better news uh, on the activity front, specifically, Carlos mentioned this to me yesterday, uh, in India, where COVID-19 cases have fallen sharply and PMI data points to a faster pace of recovery. 
Asset prices in general have soared, meaning that those who aren't on the prop property ladder or invested in the stock market may find it even harder to do so in the future. Financial markets have been gripped by the sharp swings in many risky assets in recent weeks, be it within the stock market, cryptocurrencies, or digital assets. I even anecdotally heard of someone paying 100,000 US dollars for a video of a basketball dunk in late January. Uh, whether these are one-off events or signs of a bubble or a broader shift in demand towards high-risk assets will be interesting to watch. From my perspective, just in general, talking about the US dollar, we've obviously seen a little bit of benefit at the beginning of the year. We started the year, everybody bearish the dollar, and so we obviously had to have a position washout. That was accompanied by uh, US Treasury yields uh, peaking. But this strength in the dollar will likely suffer from diversification flows over the long term. European recovery has stalled because of COVID, and despite the Brexit deal, uh, the BOE and the ECB are still investigating and talking about negative rate potential. So this leaves the US dollar as the ultimate counter-cyclical currency and could remain under pressure as a global growth and global trade recover, and as corporates and central banks have to sell US dollars to buy their home currencies and liquid proxies, respectively. The Democratic Party's control over the US Congress and the presidency could also result in higher taxes and overregulation and reduce the appeal of dollar assets. These, combined with lingering concerns about the US twin deficits and the US dollar's overvaluation, could encourage some further diversific diversification out of the US dollar in the long term. In the near term, however, a more aggressive financial stimulus and better control over the pandemic could give Treasury yields and risk sentiment a boost and thus help the dollar regain some ground. What I'd like to do now is hand the, uh, hand the ball over to Carlos and just for Carlos to recap his perspective um, from the last session in terms of some of the trade strategies he was looking at implementing and how he's, uh, how he's managing his book at the moment. Carlos. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, guys. Yeah, more or less, you uh, did a uh, very well uh, summarize of what happened, like Joseph said, uh, the last year, the V-shape recovery was crazy. Nobody was expecting uh, this kind of recovery. But not only this, markets are doing new highs. Markets are disconnected from the reality, in my opinion, a little bit. But from the past uh, webinar we did, the last session we did, uh, I was saying that uh, not now, not this year or last year, well, maybe this year, but that stocks for me are overvalued. Like Joe said, they are very expensive. It's very expensive. You are paying the profits of the guys that bought five years ago, 10 years ago. The prices of the stock market is very high for the uh, versus the production versus the activity. The economic activity is going down every day. So economic activity down, stocks up, a lot of debt. I think it's a cocktail for a sharp, uh, at least a retracement on the, on the, in my opinion, on the indexes. It didn't happen last year. Uh, I said in the last webinar that I was expecting a recovery, a, a, at least a drawdown, a small recovery, and I'm still expecting it. It doesn't mean that I'm going to go and sell tomorrow because the risk on is you can see that uh, there is a risk looking uh, theme on the market. Everybody is looking for risk right now. Uh, we have the Fed, the Federal Reserve behind supporting all the time with more cheap credit, uh, cheap credit. Um, we saw today the consumer price index is flat. That's good for the Fed because it means that they will not need to raise rates early so they can wait a bit to raise the rates of the fed that's very good for for america and right now but the problem is inflation in theory should go up so the dollar is under pressure commodities are up actually in my opinion the commodities i'm long come i i expect the commodities to keep uh, expanding uh, and i said this before the commodities uh, is an interesting market are um, soybean uh, corn they are going up like crazy um, hello, Unita. I see some comments from the people. Uh, so my expectation for this year is maybe a reality check for the traders. Why? Because uh, indexes, mostly on America, North America indexes, uh, looks like there is no uh, penalty, only long. There is no possibility of it to fall down. And this is going to be a reality check for many traders that are now buying late. Actually, in my opinion, they're buying a bit late. 
So I'm expecting a drawdown on that. The dollar is under pressure. And I think I see a kind of uh, currency war right now. I can see this, I can feel this kind of currency war where every country is fighting to have the currency not very strong because it will not help for export, import. So you want to have your currency not very strong. So, um, and looking at the markets, uh, if you check, for example, the best indexes for the last year in terms of per performance, the first one is the Kospi 200, is South Korea index. It uh, gained a 40% uh, rally, a 40% uh, increase in one, the last year, starting from today, 52 weeks. Kospi, Shenzhen, the Hang Seng, Taiwan, Shanghai. For me, Hong Kong, uh, India, Asia is now the main investment hub. I can see the inflows of money going from Europe and North America to uh, Asia. So this year is hard to know, it's impossible to know, but I think the indexes, they will have less uh, easy way up. I think it's going to be a bit more resistance at the top. One of my views, there are many things, but <laughs> maybe Mike want to, maybe Mike want yeah, to. No, thank, thanks for that, Carlos. Um, I've, I also have been watching the indexes. I've I was actually watching this uh, trade today in the S and P above thirty nine twenty, and it's uh, starting to roll over here. I think we don't get me sorry, but don't get me wrong, guys. I'm not saying to go short any index. I mean they are strong right now, but I'm expecting at the moment I can see the first uh, fear movement down. You see like this kind of fear, yeah, kind of panic. When I see this first panic, maybe on the second wave down on the second panic, yeah, and uh, maybe it's a time for. But now is. It's crazy right now. Good stuff, Carlos. Uh, Mike, do you want to bring us up to speed on uh, on your thoughts um, from the last session and how they've um, how they've played into how you're managing your trading book at the moment? Yes, of course, I want to. Uh, that's, that's the reason why I'm here, and um, I have to apologize. My my background is to see at the moment. Uh, my OBS has crashed, uh, but I'm happy uh, that the camera is still working. I hope I hope you can hear me loud yeah, and clear. Loud and clear. Loud and clear. Great, that's good to hear. So, um, what's happened? Um, I would. I, I. I don't want to talk about um, the uh, the things that we have heard about from um, Carlos and Joseph. I would like to uh, talk a bit about the uh, the biggest difference between uh, the first and the second wave of the COVID. Uh, because of what happened on the market is known, um, but uh, I, I noticed from from talking with other um, private traders, uh, many of them don't know the difference between COVID wave one and COVID wave two. The biggest difference is that uh, during the first period, um, we had a complete lockdown, and we had um, a lockdown uh, also for the for the productive companies, and uh, that was a huge problem for for the worldwide economy because of we had interrupted and delivery chains and that was a really huge problem um, the, the, the situation now is different because of we have um, the yeah the, the producing companies can still work we see this here in Germany we see this in, in USA we see it in China we see it in Europe um, this sector is still working uh, not on the levels that we had before corona but uh, they are still working and this is these are good news for the for the economic uh, development, for the job markets, and um, of course uh, for um, all the debts that we have at the moment. Because of someone has to pay it, and as long as the um, producing companies are work, there is money flow um, during the economies. That's a huge difference. Um, the worst thing is, of course, um, the limitations for the smaller companies, uh, small and mid-sized companies especially um, in the in the sector of hotel, restaurants, leisure, traveling, and so on, they are under huge pressure and they have really huge problems. Um, and I hope, I really hope uh, they get helped out uh, from the from the governments. Uh, but um, when you have a look to the indices, you see nothing of these problems because of in the in the in the large indices overall in the world um, are the big companies and the big companies have not these huge problems as the smaller companies have. So that's uh, that's the thing why I think um, the indices are where they are at the moment, um, raising in, in, in bullish uptrend. And um, it doesn't matter if 
if it's too expensive or not when we heal to the markets we we should follow the markets and i'm pretty sure the market will show us when stocks are too expensive and as long um, as the market is the opinion he can uh, or that the market can can earn money um, make profits on on the um, increasing indices for example we will see they will invest um, this is this is uh, what we see here and the economic uh, recovering process is also something that we can see very positive at the moment um, compared to um, the first lockdown where everything were locked down in lockdown um, at the moment uh, last year it was I think in in May or June here in Germany um, in, in, in the moment where all the shops and restaurants were open, people could go back to work, um, we had a complete different world. People were back in the cafes, restaurants, so they had money, um, they got uh, short uh, time work and money from, from the government for that, so um, we have no liquidity problem whether in the big companies nor um, during um, the, 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 the payments, the payroll checks for the staff and the companies were everything fine. So this is um, the situation that we had the last time. And I guess, and this are the expectations um, from the markets at the moment too, when we get the next recovery, that means when we come back from the, from the current lockdowns and going back a, a little bit to normal, it doesn't matter if we get the same problem in, in, in October, November, December this year, the time between um, is very important for the markets, for the currency market, for the index market, and for uh, for the commodities, of course, too. And this is uh, what I'm looking forward at the moment to see what happens. And uh, we see huge movements. The indices are strong. Um, gold and silver are pretty much or, or pretty close uh, to the uh, US dollar development. That means a strong US dollar will bring pre pressure to this uh, to these commodities and uh, slowing down a US dollar will bring uh, the prices for silver and gold up again. This is what I see at the moment. And then uh, we have to talk about the, the oil market. The oil market, it's a bit um, different at the moment. We are, we are in a very strong market and that is going up we have a very strong um, uptrend at the moment and it's not correlated uh, to the US dollar and in my opinion um, is this a sign uh, for an um, recovering um, producing economy that means the more um, um, the economy, the weak economy is recovering, the, the more energy needs the industry and the more um, energy uh, the industry needs, the more oil do we need. And the second thing is, um, the more the economy recovers and the lockdowns are going back, the more um, private traveling activities will we see. And this is anything that will also um, increase the demand of oil and this will push the oil price to the next levels. And this is what I see at the moment for the next months, would I say. And one thing is also very important. Um, Carlos was talking about um, the, uh, the, uh, the central banks. Uh, there's a big difference between um, the uh, European Central Bank and uh, the US uh, Central Bank. Um, both have the same problems. Um, both work uh, more or less in the same style, but I think um, the uh, US um, Federal Reserve, the Fed, is doing a better job. And when we have a look um, what they have um, in, in planning for the next months, um, they have uh, in mind they want to have a very, very strong job market. Uh, they want uh, the most people should work in, in, in USA. This is the first thing. And the second thing is that um, the debt rate is so huge that they can't stop um, the purchase program. So we will see um, very cheap money also during the next months, and this will push the markets up. And uh, this one would weaken the US dollar, but there is one thing that is pro US dollar. And uh, this one thing is um, the bond market. We see it at the moment, uh, five years, 10 years, 30 years, um, the interest rates are increasing. And that means um, when we see in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the, not in the near time future, but in the next um, five or 10 years, decades, the interest rates are increasing at the moment. And that makes um, the US market market 
especially the bond market, more interesting for international um, investors looking for um, risk um, and bond market, the, the riskless bond market. And when they start to invest in the US bond markets, there is a higher demand for the US dollar. And this will bring um, more demand on the dollar and bring the, the prices up. So it's a very crucial moment at the moment if we see um, prices below the 90 or above the 90 um, US dollar for, for, for the future. This is crucial for the for the next month, what I say. Totally agree with you there. Great, uh, great review, Mike. Okay, let's move on to the third section here and start to think about one of the key dynamics, uh, not just for the markets, but I guess for the global population as a whole. And that's really to do with the vaccine development and distribution around the world. Is my microphone on? It is, okay. <laughs> um, so the vaccinations in January were um, really largely as anticipated by the markets, but the rollout is diverging really across developed markets. While the UK is uh, progressing pretty rapidly, the EU has, held, has been held back by limited supply and the US faced distribution challenges. Uh, what we can expect uh, with respect to vaccines to deliveries is that we should see some type of acceleration in Europe and the US as supply disruptions ease and new vaccines arrive. Uh, markets assume that jo the Johnson & Johnson distribution, which starts later this month in the US, in March in the UK and in early April in the EU. And we also have the Novax inoculation kicking off in April in the UK and US. Estimates suggest that the US and Germany have administered only one third to two thirds of the, of the available doses respectively. This reflects a lack of planning and a mismatch between supply, distribution capacity and demand in the US and the precautionary stockpiling that's been touted in Germany. Markets expect substantial improvements in all countries. Um, the current consensus is that uh, the majority of the European population should be vaccinated by mid-year. Important point estimates at which 50% of the population have received their first dose are April for the UK, May for the US, and June for the EU. Uh, Germany to hit its 50% 50, uh, 50 point at some time in June. And at the same time, Italy, Spain, followed by France in July. However, in South Africa, trials point to a reduction in vaccine efficacy in preventing moderate disease from new strains. Crucially, however, the vaccines appear to remain effective at, pre at preventing severe disease and hospitalization. Combined with rapid UK and US timelines, this supports the view that the UK and US hospitalizations should decline further in coming weeks and months. And as such, the market expects a robust annualized Q1 GDP growth of about 5% in the US and to start easing of UK uh, restrictions in March, setting the stage for a rebound in uh, second quarter GDP in the, in the UK. While the timelines for uh, the European GDP and the, uh, the dissemination of the vaccine look like they will continue to hobble uh, GDP growth in Europe for the coming quarter. Uh, one of the um, highlights that I've been, or one of the, the dynamics that I've been uh, talking about is the higher vac vaccination rates amongst G10 countries are actually contributing to the currency outperformance, even uh, with the control for uh, the detriments of exchange rate performance, such as risk sentiment or uh, product, commodity prices and relative interest rates. Um, vaccination rates are having a pretty large and discernible impact in currencies like euro sterling, which has been under the gun since uh, the disparity between the performance of the EU uh, vaccine dissemination and uh, the UK has become so prominent. And we've also seen a similar dynamic uh, in the dollar yen. Part of the reason for this is that the large leads the US and the UK have over Japan and the Eurozone in terms of vaccination rates are driving this currency dynamic. Importantly, even when taking into account the relatively higher COVID infection rates in the US and the UK, relatively higher um, vaccination rates are leading to the US dollar and sterling outperformance versus its counterparts. Vaccination rates have less but still significant impacts in the euro dollar, Aussie dollar and the dollar CAD. So this is an interesting dynamic, which is potentially a short term dynamic, but one that certainly should be pay, uh, that traders should be paying attention to. 
Um, Mike, with respect, oh, sorry, Carlos, with respect to uh, the vaccine rollouts, what sort of dynamics are you seeing coming into play? Thank you, Patrick. I'm not sure. I'm not sure about this um, about this view. I'm not really sure because we were talking yesterday with Joseph. Also, said that um, the market already discounted this. The market is already taking into consideration that uh, everybody is gonna get vaccine, more or less. The problem is, is maybe not the vaccines itself. It's more the results of the economy of the countries that are not getting vaccine, the measures, the politician, the measures that the, the politicians are taking. In Spain, for example, we have a very uh, dependent uh, service country, restaurants, hotels, uh, tourism. So it's doing a lot of damage, the lockdowns, a lot of damage. Last year, 100,000 companies closed <clears throat> in one year. So mostly small and medium businesses. So I'm not really sure there is a direct uh, correlation. I didn't check very profound, but I'm not really sure, sure if there is a direct correlation between the strength of a currency versus the amount of people getting vaccinated. I'm not sure, but I think the process is going to be really a slow hassle. It's going to be a lot of hassle, a lot of... Uh, I think the, pro the process, even in Europe, is not going to be as easy as we think. Some people, they don't want to get vaccinated. Some of the vaccines already, <clears throat> the um, uh, percentage of uh, healing are going lower. Uh, also, we are having problems, the pharmaceuticals companies, they are having problems because now they need to mass produce millions of vaccines. So this means they need to invest into logistics, uh, development, more uh, bigger... Uh, laboratories, factories, and the quality of the vaccines, some of them, as they are being mass produced, they are going lower. So it's a matter for me, it's a matter of if the general opinion trust this thing. So if the general opinion trust the vaccines and the companies behind them, maybe the politicians will follow, the people will get the vaccine and we can open the economy. But so far, even with the vaccines, still we have the same measures. So I'm not really sure if this is going to be the end of the problem, in my opinion. I, I'm not sure. No, I, 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 can, I totally agree. Um, we are, we're a long way from being out of the woods. Um, Joseph, do you have any thoughts with respect to the vaccine rollout and how that's playing into uh, market dynamics? Patrick, uh, thank you. Uh, as Carlos Cal mentioned previously, like the the market already discounted the first and the big news, like as the first shock to the market that the vaccine is here from Pfizer and many other companies. So basically, as uh, technical analysts, we need to see the reaction of the market and then predict uh, what the next move uh, will be. Uh, basically, before the vaccine was uh, like invented, the vaccine has uh, triggered, like at the end of 2020, has triggered a burst of optimism uh, that the global economy is poised for a powerful rebound in 2021. And let's be honest, uh, the game changer was the vaccine. However, the hope behind the vaccine is one thing, and actually seeing the evidence of a vaccine is, is quite another. Like some are saying that the results of the vaccine from Pfizer and Johnson & Johnson, as you mentioned, AstraZeneca, were better than expected. That's why they are still optimistic to see good returns uh, in equity market this year. Like I will directly put the relation between the vaccine and the equity market because the first shock wave will be directly impacted to the equity market. And then we might, uh, let's say, analyze and project what might happen to the other, uh, let's say, products. Because as Carlos mentioned before, the risk sentiment is on at the moment. So basically, all the eyes are on the Dow Jones, on the US indices, on these uh, numbers. So in order to analyze, let's say, the current levels of the equities, let's go back in time. Uh, the early stages of the rally was powered by the fiscal we said, we said it in the, in, the, in the previous panel by the fiscal and monetary stimulus packages from the central banks, trillions, trillions of dollars, right? And then uh, there's, there was a shift from optimism to near euphoria, in my opinion, of course. Uh, first of all, it was triggered by the win of uh, Joe Biden for the presidency. Second, by the boost of the, of the big doses of stimulus. And last but not least, the vaccine which is like was from, from several companies. So the vaccine have cemented the view that at the end of the tunnel, there's, there's light, all right? 
And let's be realistic, the vaccine, let, let's call it the vaccine happy markets at the moment. At the current levels, I will be calling it the vaccine happy markets. So it, it, it might be becoming concerning uh, to the immediate economic dangers we might face and the enormous long-term uh, damage that this pandemic has already, already caused. And thus suggest there is a near-term danger we might be facing, all right? Like, technically speaking, I've been talking about 31,500 a lot of times, like previously on the Dow Jones. We've reached, we've reached uh, this number today. This number is a good number. It's a good resistance level. We might see a pullback. It's not a trading, uh, let's say, uh, uh, maybe advice, but le let's be honest, like this level is good. Breaking 31,500 would, would open more room to, to 33,000. So basically, uh, we are trading near critical levels. And let's not forget, as, uh, as Mike mentioned, uh, the equity market may be damaged as well if the bond yields, he mentioned the bonds as well, the bond yield continue to climb higher as well. So this might yeah. damage as well the equity market. So after all these risks, what if the vaccine have, God forbids, uh, uh, negative effects or something we might, let's say, sur surprise, be surprised uh, with? So as a conclusion, like with, without like uh, digging into details of the vaccine, I will be watching current levels for potential sell set, setups, all right? After I get this sell setup, after I get the confirmation, I will be looking for the next move in the markets and for the potential or probable scenarios that might happen. Good stuff, Joseph. I, yeah, I mean, I agree with you. I, um, I put out a piece on the, the Tickmill blog there referencing this 3930 level in the S&P and where it looks like just at the moment. We're sort of well, look, I would like to add quickly to what Joseph says before it reminds me, it's very important. One thing is the good news of the vaccine that is already discounted. This is one thing. Yeah. And other thing completely different is if the vaccines are going to get better, the numbers, the economy, yeah, because it's going to take a lot of months. So one thing is the vaccine. Oh, we have a vaccine. Some companies, we have it. Now we are going to see if it's really helping the economy. Why? Because this will put pressure on the uh, Democrats uh, pandemic emergency, emergency program to put yeah. one trillion plus. So even with the good news, we have the vaccine, but the vaccine is not helping the economy. Okay, let's do the packets. Let's do one trillion packets. So this is also for me very important to watch out. The government, the American government will feel pressure to approve the packets if even if the people are getting vaccinated, the economy is going down. So this is important also from, and it's connected with the bonds, as Joseph said, it's like a chain of events, bonds, dollar, stock markets. It's going to be a crazy year, in my opinion. Put your belt on. Good point, Carlos. Mike, do you just want to uh, give us your view on how the, the vaccination is going to play into the market dynamic? Yeah, we, we, we all speak uh, the same language in that way. Um, I can also say what the other said too. Um, the vaccines are priced in. Uh, they, they were a very huge trigger uh, for the recovering of the markets. Uh, and I would say now at this time where we are now, um, I think um, uh, the vaccines are very important uh, for, the, for the further uh, economy uh, recovery, especially what Carla said. Uh, in Spain for hotel, restaurant, um, uh, um, luxury, and so on. Uh, this is very, very important to get this, and this will probably give uh, another boost for the economy uh, recovering because of when, when all of the restaurants and hotels are opened again, they will have a huge demand and people will travel again and um, we will see uh, this in the future. But uh, when we have um, a look to the, to the markets that we trade every day here uh, with Tigma, uh, other things are in that time much more important. And this is what uh, the Federal Reserves, the central banks are doing, the governments are doing with the programs to protect um, the, uh, the, the economies of the own countries. This is what I would I say much more important. Um, and the third one is uh, a thing we have also a question to this, 
um, uh, we have a question to the uh, um, to related to to inflation, um, and uh, this is a thing what a lot of traders have uh, not um, not uh, faced till now. Many people say, "All right, um, we have so much money around the world. The central banks print money. Um, how we can read it?" Um, and um, this must be bad for our economy. And I'm, I'm totally different opinion. We have um, the modern money theory. And uh, the modern money theory uh, is saying exact that uh, what the central banks uh, in Europe and uh, in in in, uh, in 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 Asia and in USA are doing. Um, they 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 give a lot of money. They spend a lot of money. They print a lot of money. And um, but as long as this money um, is not um, in in the in the in the wallet um, of of the people in 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 a, in a country, as long it will not be spent. So the money from the uh, from the central banks will flow into the um, into the banks and uh, into the um, big um, companies and they don't use it to to purchase things uh, they use it for our uh, purposes and this is why we don't will see um, an extreme high inflation that other people might uh, in mind because of when they think uh, to the printing um, of money during the central banks and this is very very important that means um, think about um, to learn a bit uh, the modern money theory and you will see all of uh, the uh, the actions from the central banks in a totally different light so this is what i want to say and uh, for this one um will uh, we will see um, um, the impacts more to the um, currencies, um, how Carlos um, or Joseph said, we have to look as analysts to uh, levels that are too expensive or too cheap. And this is, these are levels where we are at the moment more often. Let's have a look to the, to the US dollar. It was extreme low and now we came a bit back. Maybe we see a bit more recovery or have a look to the New Zealand dollar or the Aussie dollar. They are extreme high at the moment and they really extreme levels that we have many years before and when we see um, where these levels are situated and when we learn from the history what happens over there we can just expect when we are in a huge um, one of these huge extreme levels, uh, we will see the, the reaction to the opposite. And this is uh, what we should have in mind as, as analysts and traders to find the right uh, places and to write um, the trends from the support or the resistance. One question. I have for Mike one question. I want to ask him something because it's interesting. Sorry, Patrick. You said Mike, that, uh, and I agree with you that the this uh, uh, the package, the help in the money is going to be on the companies. It's going to be on the banks. It's not going to go straight into the people's pocket. And yes. This is important. What do you think with these packages? With these. Uh, packages relief, this money printing insane. Do you think this will translate into uh, more jobs into the economy? This is the question I have. Do you think it will be translated, the printing into more jobs or, or, or growth? Yes, it will. <laughs> <laughs> but let, let let me explain this why um i know um uh, i don't know i'm asking myself and uh, you yes said and, this, and, this and companies what are they gonna do with the money create more carlos, carlos uh, we too live in in in, in different countries and uh, well, germany is yeah. not to compare um uh, with with spain where where you live and um the, these different um, um economies have uh, different things to consider but one thing is extreme important um, to to understand this what uh, the money will do, and uh, the first time that I was um, in direct contact um, to the money printing was in two thousand and eight when Lehman crashed. So, and this was the first time as I could see how the printed money helped to support the markets and to support the international job market. With Bernanke, no? With Ben Bernanke it was, no? Right. Yeah. And, and this was the first time as I understood what's the difference between the old world and the modern money theory. And since then, I see how good the modern money theory works and it works fine. And since then, I know thousands of people, they say, this is not good 
what the central banks are doing. And it was in 2008. And have a look where we are now in the indices. We are much, much higher. The economies developed extreme good, even if we had uh, some pullbacks in between. This is absolutely normal. But the money printing helped the economy for the indices and the companies. Um, commodities and um, currencies are totally different. Currencies swing between extreme high and extreme low levels. And this is what we see uh, when the central bank is um, printing more money as another one. We will see, for example, when um, the, uh, the European economy print much more money than the, Euro, uh, the US economy, we'll, we will see a weaker Euro and a stronger dollar. And what will happen uh, with the chart? We will see the trends. And, and this is what we can see here. But for the, for the economy, for the job market and so on, I think also for the future, it's, it's for the moment, a pretty good working system. Good stuff. Okay, guys, we're going to move into the uh, the final section here, um, where we're going to look at uh, at some of the tail risks. And uh, when we talk about tail risks, what we're talking about is the uh, the what if scenarios. The uh, you have the known knowns and the known unknowns, I guess. So, um, with respect to the markets, obviously the pandemic is. It's far more than just a health crisis. It's also affecting societies and economies at their core. While the impact of the pandemic will vary from country to country, it will most likely increase poverty and inequalities at a global scale. Making achievement of social care programs even more urgent. Without urgent socioeconomic responses, global suffering will only escalate, jeopardizing lives and livelihoods for many years to come. Immediate development responses in this crisis have to be undertaken and with an eye to the future. Development trajectories in the long term will be affected by the choices countries make now and the support they receive. There are, to my mind, three implications for uh, tail risk at the moment. Firstly, uh, while the regular virus flare-ups um, and annual booster shots and some lingering consumer risk aversion are likely in the coming years, it seems as if the staggered reduction of hospitalizations and fatalities amongst the vaccinated should drive some type of global growth. Secondly, what about a severe downside risk in terms of the evolution of a new strain for which vaccines would not sharply lower the risk of disease and hospitalization? This in turn would require another round of vaccination, which would hammer global GDP again. Thirdly, we have the scenario whereby there are risks, as Carlos was talking about earlier, of reinfection and the reinfection actually being more deadly and negating the efficacy of the vaccination in general. And how this then would impact not just developed markets, but also the potential for it to cripple emerging markets who are not in a position to revaccinate as rapidly as we could see in developed markets if these scenarios play out. So those are the three scenarios that I'm, I'm thinking about in terms of uh, what we could be looking at down the line uh, with respect to the virus and the implications of, uh, of, of modeling out or thinking about where we could see some potential terrorists. Guys, do you want to, to chime in where, where you're thinking on, on what you're looking at? Maybe Joseph, if you want to, kick off there like patrick i have nothing clearly in mind for this uh, major point you mentioned but like um i would like to to uh, shift like from these ideas into directly what's happening now in the markets and looking at the retreat retreat in the dxy in the dollar index like after these uh, we have seen new strains in south africa we have seen new strains in uk and we have seen some vaccines that doesn't work on these uh, new strains effectively or, or 100%, let's say. So basically we have faced like a little bit of this tale of this uh, 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 insight we are talking about or you, are, you mentioned. So basically what happened and we are seeing uh, more depreciation for the dollar index. What would be uh, technically and for the markets, for the capital markets, and I think all these, uh, all the followers and all the participants today would like to hear what is the best, uh, let's say, scenario or what, uh, what is the best uh, possible product to invest in for the 2021. Like, 
in my opinion, uh, uh, going or uh, uh, let's say choosing high yield currencies, for example, we, we, we did see this uh, uptrend in Aussie and New Zealand and outperforming at the beginning, the Aussie and New Zealand were out outperforming all these other currencies. I expect the dollar index to keep weakening in the, in the coming future, even if we face some up and downs for the, for the vaccination or for some new strains that might pop up. Uh, I would like to see uh, gold and commodities after this correction, after this pullback is, is what's happening now. I would like to see gold maybe topping to new highs, maybe reaching 2,300, 2,400 uh, uh, in 2021. Uh, maybe I would like to see the, the dollar uh, weakening again against the Japanese yen and the uh, Swissy. So I would like to, to uh, let, let's say, choose the high yield currencies if I would like to invest in currencies. And I would like to sell the dollar index uh, against all these major currencies and choose commodities, for instance. So basically, this is what I would uh, think of. Nothing clearly about what would be uh, happening for the mutation or, or the infection, as Carlos mentioned. So basically, I shifted uh, my thoughts to the markets directly. Good stuff. Carlos? I kind of agree with uh, Joseph that is nothing clear right now. It's the beginning of the year. Uh, the last Fed uh, meeting, uh, Powell uh, said that they are not increasing the program. It may mean that, like a uh, break, you know, like because maybe the Fed didn't don't like the pandemic, uh, the new package of the Democrats. Maybe they don't like it because it will raise inflation up and they will be forced to raise rates. So anyhow, what I mean is in terms of the markets right now, it's a um, weird mix because we have risk on risk looking but uncertainty is to the maxes in many things because we don't know the process of the vaccination we don't know the new strains uh, for example in spain here now uh, the astrazeneca i think or pfizer uh, the government uh, recommend not to uh, get vaccinated if you are m more than 55 years old so it's a bit weird now this uh, i'm not sure how <clears throat> in my opinion uh, i like the Swiss franc, it should be something that we need to look at it because already Euro Swiss is already going down, not very volatile, but it's something that we need to remember that usually franc, the Swiss franc, when uh, things get really nasty and really bad, usually the Swiss franc goes higher because it's a safe heaven. So we need to look for uh, Euro Swiss, a short. We need to look for dollar Swiss also. Dollar Jen, I'm not so sure. It's interesting. It has been forming a triangle for years, but it never broke. I have a very important level on the dollar Jen is the 104, 600. If it breaks below, maybe it will help. But I'm looking into Swiss franc. I'm looking into wait a little bit to um, um, the next month, March, uh, May, to see how uh, the market uh, get, uh, I mean, um, the information we receive from the, the economies and the central banks, we need to still to digest. It's very early for me to know this year. It's a bit early. I agree with that on that side with uh, Joseph that we need to wait for the market and see. So far, I think dollar, um, it has very positive things, but it has also very bad things, the dollar right now, because it's printing a lot. I don't think it's under pressure and the commodities are outperforming right now, mostly everybody, the commodities and the stocks, basically. So I will wait, wait a bit, a little bit, but I will be looking for safe heavens this year if things go a bit uh, bad. Gen, uh, Swiss franc, gold, maybe silver. Even Bitcoin, I can see some inflows from stocks maybe to Bitcoin. I can see that the Bitcoin is uh, receiving a lot of attention lately. But for me, it's very parabolic. It's very steep, the angle. So buying now Bitcoin for me is not a good idea. I will wait and see. We need to wait, I think, in my opinion, a little bit. Good stuff, Mike. Back again. Great to hear what you say, Carlos. And um, Joseph, uh, what we do is we know actually nothing. Exactly. <laughs> like, 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 like always. Sure. Like That's always. Sure, we, all, all what we can do is uh, we can we can have a look for for chances 
we should always have in mind uh, the risks of a market. And um, Carlos, you mentioned uh, the Swiss francs. You must imagine um, this, uh, the Swiss franc is a safe, uh, safe haven currency. I forget, I forget to say that the Swiss National Bank don't like this at all. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know, and, and 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 you can see this: the interest rate, the interest rate uh, in, in 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 Switzerland is. Minus 075. Yeah, yeah. This is so extreme expensive to park money uh, in the Swiss franc. But, and it still is but going up. <laughs> they do it. This is absolutely insane. So uh, what can happen? Yeah, um, um, Patrick, uh, you asked me um, what are my expectations for this year. It's uh, like like Carlos said. It's it's really hard to say it from now, and uh, I say this the whole year long um, because of I never know what comes tomorrow and the day after tomorrow. For this reason, I always follow what the market is doing. But um, I have I have a scenario. I have a good scenario and the worst case scenario. Maybe the the the, the worst one at, 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 at first one and uh, the worst case scenario is that we will see um, something like last year a hard winter um, a spring where we can see um, um, lockdowns that are getting back things are getting better and then um, after the summer the virus a mutation or whatever will come back and force the economies uh, in the next lockdown in the third wave um, this is the worst case scenario that i have and uh, this one in mind um, we should just have a look into the uh, to the history of of uh, the uh, the equities or the currencies or the commodities that we want to trade we just have to see what happens last year and i'm pretty sure something similar will happen this year too. And uh, the good scenario is that we will see, oh, sorry for the interruption. Um, the good thing is um, when we don't see um, the mutations uh, and the mutations uh, bring back the pressure into the markets uh, that we can see a good recovering year, a good year, a recovering year for 2021. And uh, when we see uh, the latest uh, earnings in USA, for example, <clears throat> they were everything in the in the in the in the in the mean thing. They were very good over the expectations of the analysts. But you you must say the analysts had had pretty low expectations. But we see uh, the economy is recovering, and when we don't see a third wave, um, this is very positive, and we can probably see more and more recovering markets, and that will be fine for commodities uh, for the stock markets, uh, but for the uh, currencies, I'm really not sure what will happen. We have the euro, uh, we have the central banks, we have the, um, the uh, US dollar, we have the Fed. The Fed can uh, raise uh, the, the interest rates that will affect uh, the US dollar when it's not too high for the interest rates. And there are so many risks on this side um, that I'm really not able to say what we will see in two or three months. So uh, my suggestion is let us have a look into the charts and follow the money. Good stuff. Well, hopefully we can uh, we can re reconvene again in a couple of months and uh, we'll have a bit more information to play with and be able to, uh, to give some more insights. Um, that concludes the, um, the conversation between, between us here. Um, what I guess I'd like to do now is, is open up uh, the Q and A, and see if anyone's got any questions they'd like me to uh, to put to the panel. Um, happy to do that for the next uh, five or ten minutes or so, if there uh, if there are any questions. Well, guys, it's looking like we've done a, uh, a world-class job of explaining everything. <laughs> As, uh, it doesn't appear to have any questions at the moment. That's um, the central banks, I think Europe, uh, the European Central Bank is more open to even lower rates, lower rates even more, or keep printing more versus the, the Fed, the, Reserve, the Federal Reserve is already not so eager to lower. So this will put pressure on the euro dollar to the downside. Uh, maybe we can see an euro dollar at the end of the year of 113, 112, 
because uh, we can see that also the 122 level in the euro dollar is not good for uh, Europe. They don't like that. We don't like this strong uh, uh, euro. And you can see that already uh, Christine Lagarde said on the last meeting that they are even open to uh, even lower a little bit more or increase the packets versus uh, America, that North America, USA, the Federal Reserve is already more... Uh, a bit more hokies. So this may put a downside pressure on the euro dollar, I forget to say. Okay, we've got a question from Fias. Um, with respect to inflation or deflation after lockdown, some studies suggest that a big part of the stimulus program won't be cash printing, which suggests that we won't face bigger than expected 2% inflation. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 don't, see, uh, I don't see real inflation uh, raising its head, in, certainly in the US, anytime soon. We just had a very... Uh, another very weak CPI print. Um, I, I mean, to my mind, what's happening with all these stimulus checks are uh, you've got a lot of retail traders or ex-sports gamblers uh, piling into uh, stocks, cheap stocks, and you know they've got time on their hands and, uh, and some chips to play with. So I think that's, uh, that seems to be what's driving, or, or that seems to be the main use of these stimulus checks in the US. It doesn't appear, certainly if you look at um, rental, Accommodation in, in New York, for example, we're not seeing any uptick there. Um, the move still appears to be uh, out of the cities in the US. And so we're seeing a reduction in terms of rental inflation, which was a big driver. And the same can be say, said for healthcare over there at the moment. We're not seeing any real healthcare inflation. And now with Biden, a Democrat back in the, the White House, we're likely to see some type of uh, Obamacare type scenario reinstated. So that's not going to really drive inflation. Uh, from the healthcare channel, which we normally expect to see. Does anyone else have any thoughts on uh, on inflation in the US and the stimulus programs? Yeah, maybe I would like to say a few words to this. Um, and um, the, the, the simple, clear message is uh, we just have to have a look to the bond markets. Uh, this is the one thing. And uh, the second one is that we should have a look to the commodities, um, the soft commodities and uh, the uh, commodities that we need uh, for, the, for the industry. And uh, these are things, uh, they are really, really uh, real. Um, we see at the moment uh, that prices uh, for soft commodities increasing in time um, and uh, the prices for uh, steel or copper or whatever are also really, really high at the moment. And uh, when this uh, is a trend that will last for for a very very long time, then can we see maybe a much higher inflation, um, and this can be pressure bring pressure on the markets. But it's not yet the time uh, to 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 be worried about this. We should have this um, in mind, uh, but it's in my opinion too early um, to face this too much. And that's right. Yeah, that that's uh, that's right, Mike. I mean, the the commodity drive I think that we're seeing at the moment is basically all. Um, premised on the idea that, you know, hopefully markets are going to be reopening and it's that reflation trade where, um, where like, like we've said, we, uh, we're yet to see if that's actually going to play out uh, in real time. Um, another question here, what about commodities, gold and silver? Were we, uh, where we are witnessing a sell-off in gold and an increase in silver? Uh, I don't think. No. I don't think. Um, I mean, there's there's a small difference between gold and silver. Um, silver is needed for the industry, gold not really. Um, uh, this can be a bit a difference, but when you see the long-term charts uh, from gold and silver, um, they are pretty pretty uh, pretty much the same. And um, I'm not really sure if you see a sell-off or um, in 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 gold and an increase in silver. I would say uh, they go in in long term um, the same direction. Um, we were witness from the uh, we witnessed the uh, the uh, the work of the Reddit Wall Street um, um, guys in the last week. Uh, they pushed uh, silver um, very very extreme high in a very short time, but then uh, there was uh, nothing to do more, and, and silver crashed down. And now it's similar to gold. I don't see this um, when we see a huge rally um, in gold and silver. I would say it's a bit related to the US dollar. And when we see uh, that people need a safe haven, but uh, you should always have in mind what happens last year as the first, uh, this, the first wave of COVID came, um, gold and silver were also sold like every uh, asset 
in, in, in the markets because of people needed money. And when you need money, you don't care about uh, of the worth of, of gold and silver. When you need money, you sell everything what you got and take the money to pay your life and your bills. Okay. Uh, final question here that we'll cover. Uh, you need to ask for the moment, which one uh, is best to invest in gold or dollars? And we're going to leave this with Carlos to, uh, to chime in. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, I don't know the future. If I will know the future, I will not be here right now. Sit down here. Uh, we need to keep in mind that the gold silver ratio is going down like crazy. Okay. This is very important. Uh, it means the gold silver ratio it means how many ounces of gold of silver i need to buy one ounce of gold it's going low i, I don't have a, a chart to share but usually the long story short when the gold silver ratio is going up usually is a risk aversion safe heaven and environment when the gold silver ratio is going down usually is a risk uh, own or risk looking environment so for me, it's really hard to tell. Um, for, for me right now, technically speaking, I'm not interested into gold uh, until it break uh, the 1860 level to the upside, 1860. I need to see this uh, coming back again. I'm not very interested into, into gold uh, right now for a long, at least for a, for a buy. It's hard to know what is better, uh, Unita, but also depends on the uh, time uh, of your trade. If it's going to be one month, one year, one week. So in my opinion, I will prefer dollar right now, in my opinion, against gold. But this can change any time. What I think is the risk is on. So the people are putting money into stocks, Bitcoin, um, maybe pound, uh, this kind of uh, stuff. Uh, dollar is a bit uh, weak now, but I don't see people putting more money uh, in gold right now. So I will wait and see. Okay, well, what I'd like to uh, do on behalf of everyone here is thank all of the uh, panelists for joining us today, Joseph, Carlos, and Mike. Uh, we're gonna wrap this one up here. We're going to hopefully uh, join you again in the coming months where we will see how some of the dynamics we've discussed today start to play out in the markets and where the potential next set of opportunities develop. So uh, from me here in a windy Mallorca, uh, goodbye. Um, and we will hope to uh, see you all again at the next event. Thanks very much, everyone, for attending. Thank you, Patrick. Thank, thank, thank you very much. Everyone. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, Joseph. Thank you, Mike. Thank and you, thank Carlos. you, everybody, thank you. for being no. here. Have a nice trading day, everybody. See you soon. It was a pleasure for me. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Goodbye. Bye -bye. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>